and good morning, Soul Factory. I pray that God is continuously being felt around you in your presence. I'm grateful to be in this moment with you this morning. I'm gonna pray and I wanna just uh, jump right into this. As I feel the spirit of the Lord in several different ways around me and on me right now. And so wherever you are, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment and acknowledge that being a part of this moment doesn't happen if God is not faithful. Being a part of this moment where for some of us, it looks like just another Sunday, but somebody didn't make it to see another Sunday. Somebody is too sick to open their eyes to thank God for another Sunday. And I will be remiss to take for granted that while we're blessed and the people around us are blessed, we should often take a moment and acknowledge that what we have and who we are and what we will be in what has been going on, good, bad, or indifferent, is because and only because he is. And so Heavenly Father, in humility and thankfulness, in the spirit of gratitude, in the spirit of mercy, in the spirit of love, I thank you for another day. I thank you for another opportunity. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for everyone that gives their gifts, their time, their mind to your purpose. I thank you, God, for this day and for whatever's going to happen. I turn myself completely over to you. Have your way. And I pray, God, that I say no more, no less than what your spirit requires of me today. And that I pray that in that, God, that somebody's life be strongly affected and changed. I pray that blind eyes be open, clogged ears be open, and closed hearts be open today, God. I pray, Father God, that all of us can have, in some form or fashion, a reintroduction to who you really are and who you have always been to us. I thank you for this moment. To all glory, all honor, all praise, all worship be to the one and only living God. All those that believe say amen and amen. Amen. I'm going to jump right into this. I want to read this first and then I'll touch on it. So let's go to my first slide and I just want to read through it. And so this first slide is from Matthew 5. I'm calling this message Divine Responses, part one. Matthew 5, verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meek means quiet, gentle, submissive. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, 
for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm gonna pause right there for a second. I just wanna acknowledge everyone that maybe come across this message. You can bring it down for a second. I encourage you in the name of Christ. I encourage you in the name of Christ. I speak life unto you in the name of the Christ we serve. See, somebody listening to me right now is going through an extremely hard time right now. Somebody listening to me right now is looking for answers and nothing is making sense. Somebody look, looking at this message right now or who will come across this message does not know what to feel, does not know how to feel. But I'm here to tell you this morning, just like all the songs of praise and worship just, just said, don't you give up. Don't you quit. Don't quit on you and don't you dare quit on God because he's not going to quit on you. Things might be hard right now. You might not have all the answers right now. But that does not mean it's over for you. You be encouraged. You hold on and you keep holding on. Life is about moments. And we are all in an assigned moment right now. But don't you let the assigned moment that you're in right now dictate that this is the full scope of what your life is, has been, or will be. It's just a moment. Seek and find God in that moment. Because he wants to be sought by you. And if you seek him, he says in his word that you will find me because I'm not, I'm not hiding hard. Let's bring up the next slide, the rest of that scripture. Verse 11, is that right? Yeah, I said, I mean, verse 10. 11, yeah, keep it at 11, thank you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its savor, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. I'm going to pause right there. And I just want to say, anytime I read something this morning and we see the word law, I want you to replace the word lawful message. See, we've been talking about divine messages for some weeks now. And so when I read this morning, when you see the word law, I want you to see the word message. I'm gonna read the rest and then I'll go back. So then whoever breaks one of these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds, exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to go back to verse 18 and then you bring it down for me. It says, for I tell you truly, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a pen will disappear from the law, the message, until everything is accomplished. Bring it down. It says, not a word will be jotted out, not a stroke of this pen, will disappear from the message until everything is accomplished. 
See, what that tells me is that the law, the message was set to accomplish something in my life. See, I don't show up to teach. I don't show up to listen to the word of God. I don't sit down just to be sitting down. I sit down because the message that God is trying to get to us was set up to accomplish something in us. And not a word of that can be erased or taken away until that message accomplishes what it set out to do. See, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about divine messages. And every teacher that came in front of us had a mandate from God to say certain things that were set to accomplish something in our lives. It wasn't just so that we can have a good word, hear a good message, and then go about living as we normally do, doing what we normally do, not adjusting or changing or moving in a direction that takes us closer to who he is and who he has called us to be. Verse 19 says, so then whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do likewise will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The note that I wrote down on that verse was what am I practicing and teaching? Number one, the law, the message was assigned to accomplish something in my life. It was a comp it's supposed to accomplish something. Out of all the messages that we've heard, what has it accomplished in your life so far? Have you made any adjustments according to what the Lord Spirit has said through his servants thus far? This message is called divine responses because the reality is, is that the purpose of the divine message is to elicit a divine response from the spirit of God that's in me. If there is no divine response to the divine message, and others have touched on this in their own way, but if, if there is no divine response, taking the time to take across my plate, to take across my face, to bring into the, this aspect or season of my life, if all I'm doing is hearing the message, but I'm not making any moves in the spirit of God, then I have to ask myself, what am I practicing? And according to verse 18 that we just, verse 19 that, that I'm reading right now, what am I practicing? And then what am I teaching? Because nine times out of 10, whatever we practice is exactly what we teach. See, everybody can fake it for a, for a moment. Even preachers can get in front of a crowd and elicit something from the spirit of God that does dwell in them and give a great message and give a moving sermon and teach something that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But after that message is said and done, that man or that woman of God now has to go back and they have to do what you and I have to do. They have to look at their lives and they have to see and pay attention to are the words that just came out of my mouth actually something that I'm practicing? Is it something that I'm just teaching? Because lessons that go forward without practice have no power behind it. What do I mean by that? So let me take it out of church and put it in my house. See, I can tell my kids all of my expectations for them and what I want them to do, how I would like it to happen, when I want it to happen, and when I look up, it better be done. And then I give them those instructions based on my desires for what I need to have done. But what happens when what I'm asking them to do does not match up with what it is that I actually live and do myself? See, for a while, it will go unchallenged. For a while, 
people would just fall in line. But then that day comes. And anybody that has older kids know what that day is. That day when that child rose the courage to challenge the teacher. The day that that child grows the courage to say, hey, I understand that you're asking me to do this and you expect this, that, and the third. But is there a reason why you don't do this? See, there will come a time if it hasn't already happened, where everything that you want to see happen in your child, your child will be challenged towards you. And the reason why that happens in my personal belief on, on some occasions is that that's God's way of challenging. Are you practicing what you preach? Are you exercising the message that you're putting out? I hope this is making sense to somebody. See, I had a, I've been having a conversation. I've been feeling heavy and light at the same time, meaning excited by the presence of God, thrilled that he still talks to me. And then looking around and then feeling heavy about everything else that surrounded me. See, my wife and I had a conversation. It was a great conversation. Whenever my wife and I sit down to have conversation about world issues, we usually line up about 99.7% of the time. We line up. But because we think and talk differently, even though sometimes we're saying the same things, we there's a little bit of uneasiness, not friction, but just uneasiness in the conversation because we're in agreement, but because we communicate differently, it comes out, uh, it comes out sometimes where it seems like we're not together. I hope that makes sense. I bring that up to say that listening to her views on some of the stuff that's just going on in the news and then reading the newspapers for myself and just meditating and thinking about divine messages and divine responses. I sat back and I was asking, we really got into like current events and I'm like, the more she talked, the more internally calm and agitated I got. And she wasn't saying anything incorrect or, or out of pocket. She was just sharing her views and how she viewed things. And I was in agreement with what she was saying. But I could not explain in the moment, in that exact moment, we ended up talking it all out, what I was feeling on the inside as she spoke her truths. And I found myself in agreement with her truths, but still getting agitated and bothered on the inside. And I don't know what it is that she said exactly, but when she said it, my spirit perked up and I got the answer in that moment. And the answer was simply this. What do we expect things to be like when we remove God from everything? See, every time we turn on the news, every time we we, we read an article every time we walk down the street, something crazy is going on. Something that just doesn't make sense and something that does not sit well with my soul. And then I look at the church and the sense of thankfulness and disgust shows up because all the messages that's going out ain't divine messages. And I'm feeling all these things. And then God says to me clearly, he was just like, we have systemically moved him out of every aspect of what we do day by day. It's, it started by taking prayer out of schools. See, that doesn't seem like a big thing at first. 
but because we now have grown sensibilities to everything and everybody, now we, we just systemically started moving God out of the positions that he held, where we are now in a generation where there is a group of young folk that don't know who he is. There is a group of people that actually don't know or don't respect the fact that he even exists because we have systemically taken God out of the things that matter most, the things that kept, see, it says in the word, train up a child in the way that we, he should go, that when he is old, he would not depart from it. See, what happens when we remove the actual God and replace him with somebody else? What happens when we systemically take God out of school, systemically take God out of our workplace, systemically take God even out of our everyday family business? We take him out, but then because we still do God, as, as Ed said a long time ago, godly activities here and there, we feel like his presence in our minds is still there as it has always been. See, I'm not gonna give too much away, but if y'all haven't started uh, that this book, can you see this? If you haven't started that book that is coming up soon to talk about, I'm not gonna give, give much, nothing away, but get it. Don't delay, get it. Because see, the reality is that God hasn't gone anywhere and God's not going anywhere. But at the same time, we have moved away from him. We're not as close to him as we think we are. We're not as connected to him as we think we are. Just, just because we have spiritual activity going on in small pockets of our life. See, God is, has zero interest of being a part of my life. Hear me clearly. God has no interest of being a part of your life. See, when we give our lives over to God, we give our lives over to the Savior to be saved. We, we call him Lord and Savior. We call him Lord and Savior. This takes me back to uh, what the old people used to say back when I was young, where we got a house, God's in the house, but he's not invited in every room. We got a house. This is the house of God. This is the church of God. This right here. God's in the house, but he's not interested in just being a part of the house. God wants to be the Lord and the Savior of this house. And so what is happening continuously, even right now. And in some ways I too have fallen victim and it rebukes me every time God shows me something. We have begun to relegate God just as the world has systemically moved him out of certain aspects of how we operate in government and world and school. We too, even the believers are systemically moving God out and replacing him with likenesses of who he is. But because we have those likenesses, there's still a false belief that he's still there. I hope this is making sense to somebody. See, the revelation I got is that what did we expect the world to look like when you remove God out of the equation? See, every time I read the paper, I expect to see bad news because we've removed God out of the equation. And I pray, uh, I pray earnestly not to grow callous in heart because I don't want to begin to read the papers and then have a spirit of, that's just the way it is. No, that's not just the way it is. There is a generational gap. There's a generation that does not know who he is. 
See, in the conversation with my wife, we talked about there comes an age where his spirit speaks out to you when you're a younger person. If you've been taught, and even if you have never been taught, he calls out to you. For me, that age was 19 years old, where he called out to me and I knew it was him for sure. And in that moment, I had a real decision to make. It's like, hey, look, we know the Christian way you've been living life, meaning hot and cold, double-minded, in and out of Christ. There, there's a Christian way that you've been living. But God is calling you to a real way, a way of truth, a way of the straight and narrow path. And at the age of 19 years old, I got that call and I had a decision to make. Was I going to take a chance and say, what's actually written is real and true. And I need to start to align myself with the messages of God. I need to start aligning my behavior and my activity and the way I talk, the way I, the way I view things. I need to start aligning myself to what it is that the spirit of God is calling me to do. And at the age of 19, I made that choice. And in this conversation, thinking back on it, I now look at other 19 year olds now. I look at my now 12 year old. I look at my 10 year old. I look at my 26 year old. And then I look and I listen. This current generation, they got a lot right. They got some courage. They're ready to fight. They're willing to fight. They'll march and do whatever it is they got to do for what they believe in. You know, uh, uh, abortion rights, they'll go out and march for that. Police killings, they'll go out and march for that. Uh, whatever they believe in, they'll go out and march for it. They'll protest. They'll make some noise equal rights on the job, all great things. They'll go out and they'll make noise for it. But there's still something missing. There's still something lacking. Because somewhere in all of this good conduct, these, these, these righteous beliefs, and righteous causes. Somewhere in the middle of all this, we've left God out. And it's not all their fault. See, when I think back on how it is that I was raised and some of it annoyed me greatly, but my parents and grandparents did their best to at least keep God in my space. Knowing that you're gonna go off course one day, but we pray you come back. But see, now there's, we're entering a time where even us believers, we're not putting God in the spaces of the young people. Anymore. Does that make sense? And I'm not talking about just in church. Because see, when, when people come to church, there's an expectation. I'm talking about the light that we carry on our everyday basis. I'm talking about the message that I'm supposed to be the message that I'm supposed to carry as I walk around my house. When something hard happens and I need to respond to it, am I checking in with the spirit of God first with the understanding that somebody's always watching me? And for, for, for me, I'm saying that somebody is, is my wife, somebody is my children, somebody, somebody is, is is the people you work with. Somewhere we've forgotten that the divine message is me. I am not the messenger. That is the father. But the divine message that the father has been trying to get out has been me, has been you. It's us, we are that message. And now we're in a time where we've stopped responding to the message. Does that make sense? 
we've stopped responding to the message. One of my notes says, one of the most difficult things to do when surrounded by chaos is to respond to his divine message in accordance to his will and purpose for my life. See, I started out encouraging everybody because the deal is God is here and he's waiting for a response from us because he's given us and he continues and he will continue to give us the message. He's giving us the message right now. But the message was not intended for you just to put in your pocket and to pull it out when it's useful to you. See, when I think about relationships and I think about the relationship I have with my wife, often when I look at my marriage, I try to connect those to, as to my relationship with God in the sense, in the sense like this, where I don't expect my wife to do everything, to be the one that sends all the texts, to be the one that makes all the calls, to be the one that uh, sets up all of our activities that may make us come closer together, to be the one to take care of the children all on her own, to work a job and take care of the house, to be everything. And then when it's convenient for me to show up, get what I want from her, and then go about my business. That don't sound like a good relationship to me. Where I expect everything of her, and I don't put nothing in on this, but I expect everything from her, and then she comes up and, hey, can you help me with the laundry? And I'm always busy. Hey, you mind cooking or ordering dinner tonight because I'm too tired from work? Well, I was working too. I've always got an excuse as to why I won't do or won't be helpful. I'm always on my page when she needs something. But then I expect her to be on my page when I need something or want something from her. See, the, the reason why I bring this analogy in is that's what we've done with God. We've relegated God, our marriage to God to a one-way relationship. We've relegated our relationship to God to a one-sided, to a one-sided activity where We go to him when we need him to do something for us. And he would say, no, I pray every day. I do this, I do that. I, you know, I got a list of things that I do. But when God calls out to you and say, hey, I want you to say this. I want you to do this. I want you to go here. I want When God calls out to me, Will, when he calls out to me, am I available? When he wants me to be. Am I available when he wants to use me as a message? Am I available when he wants me to speak something into a young person's life? Am I available for his business? Am I available to be the message that he needs me to be in the moment for somebody else? Am I available when the father wants something from me? Or am I only available or do I only reach out? Is this relationship a one-sided relationship. My wife calls it uh, the ATM factor, where God has become most of our ATMs, meaning we only go to the Father when we need to make a withdrawal. And every so often, every so often, we'll go and make a deposit here and there. But usually ATMs are reserved for taking things out. And I got to ask, what kind of relationship am I dealing with right now? What kind of responses have I been giving the Heavenly Father when he's been giving me the divine message? 
I don't want to be a part of a relationship with another person or any or or anything or anybody where all I do is give, 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 give. I'm the one that calls you all the time. I'm the one that does this all the time. I'm the one that's always reaching out. I'm the one that's always asking how you doing. I'm the, I'm the only one really putting it. You don't respond to me unless I come to you first. Nobody wants to be a part of that relationship. See, I got a few, I won't even call them relationships, but I got a few people in my life right now that I choose not to talk to because the only time they reach out to me is when they have a need that they believe I can help them feel. Nobody wants to be a part of a relationship like that. Nobody wants to have to respond to the person. You know, I, I told one person who I love very much, I said, hey, look, I love you and nothing will ever change that. Nothing will ever change that. And if it ever really got real, 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 that I needed to stand beside you, I'm going to be there for you. But the only time you call me is when you want some money or you want this or you want that. But you never call just to say hi. You never call to say I'm praying for you. You never call to say none of that. You just, when you need something, you remember me. When you need something, you remember me. I don't want a relationship like that. And so do me a favor. Don't call me no more unless you just want to talk. That's how we treat the father. Even I had to find myself being rebuked, rebuked because in some instances, in some ways I've seen that's how you start to treat the father, Will. That's how we treat the father. We have an expectation of keep on receiving all these divine messages. But then when the father asks you to do something with it, you're nowhere to be found. You're always busy. You always got something. Look, we're all busy. We all got stuff going on. And that's not going to stop. But see, here's the reality. If we're always busy with our stuff, we can never be busy with his. If I'm always busy with, with my stuff, we can never be busy with his stuff. And his stuff is intended to change somebody else's life. His stuff is intended to break a yoke that somebody's been dealing with for far too long and the answer is in you. But because you're not available when he needs you to be. See, the unfortunate reality that I'm starting to see clearer and clearer as I get older and older day by day is that God has been replaced by ourselves. We've replaced God with us. His throne is still there. We still see the throne. We still act like it's there. <laughs> but we've replaced it, especially in today's time. See, today's time, when I say today's time, we are living in an age where you are the most important subjects of all topics. I am the most important subject of all topics. I'm not going to make a move unless it benefits I, me. I'm not going to make a move unless I can get clout for making this move. I'm not going to say or do anything unless you like me for it, unless you follow me for it. See, the game is starting to get set up where we start to feel important and we start to feel like somebody by the more. Even if we're saying inspirational things, we feel 
some kind of self-righteousness from the inspirational stuff that comes out of our mouth because of how many people are following us. When did it turn into following you? Now I'm talking to those of us that say we believe. It was never intended to be, the message was never intended to be about following you. Who cares how many followers you have? How many people have you turned to follow him? How many people are you turning right now to follow him? See, we have all these magical platforms where now nothing is done in secret. Now, everybody has to either like it, see it, or follow it. What would happen if we were to push all of that energy and all of that focus onto the message that God has been trying to get to us for the longest time? We're being set up, y'all. We've been getting set up. And some of us aren't making it through in the strength that we actually have to make it through because our focus is off. See, I used to read my Bible when I was reading Revelation, and I used to always wonder to myself, by myself, and to the Father, to the Spirit, why is that number so low in Revelation of those that get to get caught up when the Christ returns? Why? How, there's, you know, from the way, during that time, from the way I looked at things, and I was just like, there's no way. This number can be that low. How can so many people be deceived? That number is pretty low, God. That many people can be deceived that we won't see you when you return. We won't recognize that that, that is you because we, we all so caught. Now I'm starting to understand. Now I'm starting to see more clearly why that number is so low. For when the Christ says that he will return, and, and, and newsflash, just in case you forgot, saints, he will return. See, part of the divine message is to prepare you and me for the return. And if it's not you and me, it's so that you and I can prepare the next generation for the return. See, that is the response God has been looking for when he's giving us these messages. It's our responsibility to prepare the next generation for the return of the Christ. It's our responsibility to interrupt the programming that the world is putting on our children and on those people that we have access to. You may not be able to change anything, but I ain't got to be the one that changes. I got to be the one to drop the seed in your space to disrupt what you think is all right. See, the ways of a man seem good. The ways of a man seem right, but in the end, it leads to death. The way of a man seems right, but in the end of it all, it leads to death. See, God's looking for a response from me. God's looking for a response from you. And even if we're not here to make it over, our responsibility as believers, not just when I get to stand in front of a crowd or in front of a camera, but especially when I'm not, is to make sure that I'm making the deposits of Christ into the next generation. Because even I as a father have to admit to the, to, the heaven, to the heavenly father that I've let some stuff slide with my, own, with my own habits and my own kids. Some things of, of putting God in their, in their space constantly have, have started to wane just a little bit. Why? Because it's so easy to be distracted today. God's looking for a response from us, saints.
how do I bring glory to God when I'm operating in a certain way in a world that seems completely self-focused? I can't. The reality is, is I can't. If I'm self-focused, I can't be God-focused. You're going to be the hot or cold, but you can't be both. You can't want to be famous and want to make God famous. <laughs> you, you just got to let you go and let him be what it is. I hope this is making sense to somebody. Um, I want to go to, let's go to the next slide, the Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I'm gonna stay right there just for a second. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Take it down for a second. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. See, our feet are starting to slip, saints. We don't see it, but we're walking in step with the wicked, but still believing because we have believed for so long that we're still just walking in step with God. I'm not saying everybody. What I am saying is look at your activity. Look at your current responses to the message. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm talking to you. What are you doing? What have you been doing? What will you continue to do? What are you doing? What are you not paying attention to right now? God has been calling all of us to pay attention to something. What are you not paying? Deron asked this question years ago, and it's more relevant now than ever before. What are you not paying attention to? I must pay attention to what I'm not paying attention to. The way we do church service has changed to where we meet like this now, which means I no longer see you as often as I probably would like to which means you have now changed the way that you do service in your own house, which means there have been adjustments being made over the last three years as to how you do what you do in service to God. What are you doing right now? What are you not paying attention to? Has God now become, because we do it this way, has he now just become I'll get to that when I get to it. When he's called you at a certain hour, he's called you at a certain time. He has an expectation of you. Do you know that expectation and are you meeting up with it? Are you giving proper response to his expectation for you when it comes to service of him? Are you living up to his expectation of service to him in this current environment that you and I find ourselves in right now? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you not paying attention to right now? Bring it back up. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Am I walking in step with the wicked or am I walking in step with Christ? Or stand in the way that sinners take? Am I doing everything that everybody else is doing? Or am I still standing? or fighting to stand in the way that he's calling me to stand. Verse two, but those, but whose delight is in the Lord, in the law, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Remember when I said, you see the word law, you, we're talking about the message. Do you still delight in the message? Do you still meditate on the message? 
Verse three, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Let's not get it twisted for a second. Don't think your prosperity means you're close to God. Don't think your reaping soul process means you're close to God. I've said this before in another message, but don't think just because you're blessed with stuff, with things, with money, that that is the equivalent of God and our type. Otherwise, why would he bless me? The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Go to the next slide, please. Should be uh, the second, which one is that? Exodus, okay, give me that. All right, yeah, let's read that. Exodus 5, this is the NIV version. It says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Take it down for a second. Moses and Aaron was given a task, just like you and I have been given a task. God has sent us to somebody, somewhere, even in yourself, even in you, Will. And by the power of his spirit, he said, let that go. God has called us. God has been giving us divine messages for weeks, for months, for years. And he's been saying, let that go. See, right here it says, let my people go. See, they, they, I can call that whatever that thing is in your life, in my life. Let's call that, that them people. Let that people go. Let my people go. See, God's been sending message after message, word after word, thing after thing, saying, let that go. See, it says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. See, we live in a time now where we know everything. And if we don't know, we can just ask Google. And Google seems to know everything. And so now, I don't really need to ask God anything. But God's trying to get you to see the deeper meaning of things, the deeper revelations of life. God is trying to take you somewhere to do something with your life. But in order to be useful, you have to let that go. You got to let that go. And far too often, our responses, especially now more than ever before, because we got stuff to do. It's starting to sound a lot like Pharaoh. Bring it back up. Where Pharaoh says in verse two, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? And don't get me wrong, because some of us have been raised in this word, we aren't bold enough to say out loud, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. No, we're not bold enough to say it like that. We're just bold enough to do it with our actions. The bottom line, let's read that. It says, do I have a Pharaoh disposition with his divine message and the current instructions for my life? Do I have a Pharaoh disposition with his divine message and the current instructions for my life? Take it down. See, we don't have the courage to open our mouths and talk recklessly to God. At least you got some sense. That's some of us. Some of us don't. We may not talk reckless, but we'll still live reckless. We'll still obey and do what we want to do. And the stuff that he says, let go, he said, nah, I'm not, I'm not, who, who, who is, why should I do that? He don't really look at it that bad. See, we got a bunch, of, we don't do it like Pharaoh did actually did it we make excuses as to why we can't 
We make reasons as why it's not necessary. We, 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 we make concessions as to why it needs to remain exactly where it is. Not realizing that the spirit of God said, let it go a long time ago, let it go right now. But within our hearts, we've taken a Pharaoh disposition and says, I'm not gonna let that go. Who are you that I should let it go? And then sometimes we do let it go. But if you know the rest of this story, you know that eventually after a whole bunch of stuff, after God had to do some powerful convincing to show Pharaoh that I wasn't playing with you. After all that convincing, see, when we take a Pharaoh disposition, because God loves us so much, he still sends message after message after message to try to convince you to let that go. Because he loves us so much, he still sends message after message after message. I need you to let this go. Why? Because I have a work that I want you to do. I have a message that your life can only speak. You are the message that I need to speak to this group over here. You are the message that I need to speak to that person right there, to this situation right there. You are that message. But I cannot send this message as it is because I need you to let that go. And so trial after trial, thing after thing keeps on happening because God is trying to break down my Pharaoh disposition. I have a Pharaoh disposition. I don't know what your Pharaoh disposition is. I can only speak for myself. But when I see that feral disposition in me, I have a quick choice to make. I have to respond to the message that the Christ is sending me immediately because I don't want to, I don't want to deal with what follows as far as he chooses to convince me that his way is the best way. And then we do what Pharaoh does, had, had, to, had done even after all that convincing. We let it go. We let the people go. Pharaoh, at some point, after going through all that he could handle, decided the last thing that happened was the last straw. I'm going to go ahead and let y'all go. And he let him go, only to do what? What we still do today. As soon as he let him go, for in him, he got prideful and angry that he let him go, that you gave in. Your ego, his ego said, nah, I shouldn't have done that. I can't believe I gave in. And so he decided to chase after what he let go to the death of many of his people. See, we're no different when we take a Pharaoh disposition. We keep letting things go. And as soon as we let it go, because we've gotten so used to it, because we've gotten so comfortable with it, we chase after it until we catch it again. And when, it, when we actually catch it, if we're allowed to catch it again, we drown in it. It takes us even further away from where we were. The progress we may have been making in spirit is now over. I gotta ask myself consistently, do I have a Pharaoh disposition? See, I have to remind myself daily, we are being set up, y'all. See, we don't talk about it often and there's no need because you know there's an enemy. We all know there's an enemy and he's gonna stay doing his job. And he stays on his job. But it's gotten so to the point now that he don't even have to work hard anymore. Because he's got us all so wrapped up that we now doing the work for him. And we now believe the lie that we're still good with the Christ. We're still good with the Father. Why? Because he answers my prayers every now and again when I pray to him. Does God have access to you the way you have access to him? That's my, that's my closing question. Does God have access to you the way you have access to him? The setup's not gonna stop. We're in the middle of it right now. 
But the wonderful thing about God is that while we're in the middle of the setup, he loves us enough to let us know that we're in the middle of the setup. He loves us enough to let us know that, hey, this is the way things are going to happen. This is the way things are happening. But I will never leave you and I will never forsake you as I promised I would. God is still here. The question is, where are you? What are you doing? How are you responding to the divine messages that God has been sending into your space? If you haven't been responding in a way that you think will make the Father proud, the blessing of today, the blessing of this moment right here, right now, is that you're still breathing, you're hearing this message, and you have another opportunity to give a divine response. I pray this message helps somebody. And I pray that it not just becomes something that you just heard on another Sunday. So right here, right now, I want to pray for everybody underneath the sound of my voice. I want to first remind you it's not over. I don't care what you got going on in your life. It's not over. Don't allow your blessings to fool you into thinking that you're close to the father. What does he say? Now, if he says you're blessed and close, amen, hallelujah, God be with you continuously. But if that ain't what he's saying, my challenge to each and every last one of us, open your ears and your spirit and actually hear what he is saying to you. Not what you want to hear, what he is saying to you. What is the divine message coming to you right now? And what will be your divine response? Heavenly Father is in the name of Yeshua, also known as Jesus the Christ, that I pray before you now. I pray that you're pleased with my offering. And I pray, God, that this offering finds fertile ground in the lives of the people that listen to me. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this moment. I thank you for continuously speaking to me. I thank you for continuously giving us all mercy after mercy after mercy, especially when we don't deserve it. God, I pray right now over somebody that's listening on the sound of my voice that's having a hard time right now, God. I pray that you make it plain to them what decisions need to be made to close the gap of closeness. I pray, Father God, that we can all find ourselves in a position where we can come to you and knock at the door of who you are and be accepted and received in that door because we have made the proper responses to your divine messages. God, I pray that we not take another moment of our lives for granted. I pray that we not take another blessing that we have for granted. I pray that we not take another life of our friends, of our loved ones for granted. I pray earnestly right now, God, that once this prayer is over and we all open our eyes, God, that we come into a space where we can actually see with spiritual eyes and hear with spiritual ears. Father God, I pray for healing over those that are sick. I pray for clarity over those that are confused. I pray for strength over those that feel weak. Father God, I pray for the words to fall into the mouths of those that must speak. Father God, I pray that we will fall in line to giving the proper divine responses that you deserve from us. Forgive us of our ego human ways and help us all to be humble and to walk up right before you so that our prayers can be heard, that our prayers can be answered, and that we can all be used to change somebody's life. Help us all to see clearly what we are doing right now, what we are not paying attention to right now, God. And help us all to make a turn today, God, and to respond accordingly to your Holy Spirit. 
I thank you for your love. I thank you for your kindness. It is in the name of Yeshua, also known as Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I pray you have my life, my house, and everything attached to it. Amen and amen.